Another extremely pr important property when it comes to thermal properties is thermal conductivity. How efficient does a material allow heat to travel through it, right? Thermal conductivity. So before we dive into that, let's just quickly remind ourselves of diffusion, mass diffusion, right? Mass diffusion had this equation right here where we said that the flux of mass that's going to travel through a material is proportional to the concentration gradient, that's dc dx, and the constant proportionality, which we call the diffusion coefficient, right? So negative d times dc over d or, over times dc over dx uh, gave us our flux of matter. You know what's crazy? The exact same equations that worked for mass transfer also work for heat transfer. How amazing is that? The exact same mathematics, whether it's mass traveling through material or heat, can be used. Uh, so we have a different constant of proportionality, of course, and this time the constant of proportionality is kappa this one here, and that is our thermal conductivity. So thermal conductivity is the constant of proportionality. This time it's not telling us how much mass travels, it's telling us how much heat travels. So Q is the heat, right? If you wanna know how much heat will travel through your material, it's gonna be proportional to your thermal conductivity, and then the driving force. This time the driving force isn't a difference in the composition. It's not like there's a concentration gradient that causes mass transport. It's a temperature gradient. If you have a hot side and a cold side, heat's gonna travel from one side to the other in response to that temperature gradient, right? But it's the exact same mathematics. So we call this fix first law with diffusion. Here we call it Fourier's law, but it's the same thing, okay? So again, I've written out here Q divided by A times T because we had to make it a flux. Q is just energy. So if we want the flux of energy, then we have to do Q per area per time, right, is equal to negative kappa, our thermal conductivity, times dt dx, where that's the temperature uh, gradient, okay? So what would the units be? The units of thermal conductivity are watts per meter kelvin, okay? Where remember, a watt is equal to one joule per second, right? So joule is going to be our measurement of energy, how many joules, right, okay? Um, now there's another important term, the one difference between thermal uh, mass transport and heat transport is that when it came to the second non-steady state diffusion, right, where we figured out how things change, how, where we calculated the composition as a function of position when time is changing, when the rate is changing, we used diffusion there and we used it in fixed first law. With thermal transport, we have to use a different parameter. We have to use thermal diffusivity. So what is that? All right, well, thermal conductivity is right here. Kappa is equal to rho times alpha times Cp. Rho is our density, right? Alpha is our thermal diffusivity, and Cp is our heat capacity at constant pressure, right? So let's just do a quick unit analysis here, right? Thermal conductivity had watts per meter per Kelvin, right? So this is gonna be equal to density, so that's just do kilograms per meter cubed, just to put these all in SI units, right? Multiplied by our thermal diffusivity, right? Multiplied by heat capacity, we know that that's joules per kilogram per delta T, right? Some difference in temperature, like Kelvin. So let's just write that as Kelvin. So what must be the units of this one right here in order to end up with this over there? Well, remember that it, a watt is equal to a joule per second, so we can rewrite this as joules per second meter cubed, right? So in order to get meters alone down here, we need to have a meter squared up there, and then our kilograms are going to cancel, right? So what we need now is seconds. So this needs to be meters squared per second. This has the exact same units as the diffusion coefficient. Remember, when it was mass transport, the diffusion coefficient also had area per time. It was typically centimeter squared per second, but you know, meter squared per second, it has the exact same units as uh, mass transport, but now this is the thermal diffusivity, not the diffusion coefficient, okay? So that alpha value, that's what we're going to use with fixed second law for thermal transport. Fixed second law, again, remember it, it came from the fact that our rate of temperature, um, our, our flux of heat is changing with time, it's not constant. So now you have to take into account time, so d, d temperature, d time, has to be equal to this partial di differential equation where it's thermal diffusivity times the gradient, uh, second derivative, right? The gradient in temperature with respect to position. So nasty equation. We don't have to solve it on this class. Instead, we're going to use a solution and it's the exact same one that we saw for mass transport. How cool is that? Whether you're describing heat or mass moving through material, it's the same equations. Before it was the composition at point X, now it's the temperature at point X. 
minus the temperature that's deep within your material, right? So again, if you have this scenario, somewhere far within your material, it's T0. But then right here at the surface, you heat it up. So right at the surface now, you've got it hot, okay? So Tx minus T0 divided by Ts minus T0, where Ts is the temperature right at the surface, is going to be equal to 1 minus the error function of x, your position. x is going to be your position going this way. So this is x. Right there would be x equals 0. Over here would be x equals infinity. Right, Infinitely in your material, you have a temperature of t equals 0. Um, and then divided by 2 times the square root of alpha t, where alpha is your thermal diffusivity, right? Thermal diffusivity. So that's the key difference, is that you plug that in for alpha right there. If it was mass transport, then the same d value, your diffusion coefficient, you used it both in fixed first law and fixed second law. For mass transport, the only difference is that for fixed first law, you use thermal conductivity, kappa right here, but for fixed second law, you use alpha there. Otherwise, they're the exact same, okay? So what, let's talk about heat, uh, thermal conductivity for a minute. What makes a material a good conductor of heat versus a poor conductor of heat? To answer that, we first have to think about how heat gets carried in a material. What actually carries heat in a material? Well, the total thermal conductivity is gonna be made up from contributions from lots of things, right? As electrons move through your material, they can carry heat because they have a kinetic energy with them. You have phonons, right? Those lattice vibrations, as they move through your material, they can carry heat. You can have radiative transport of heat. That's when, like, like the sun is a giant radiative thing. It's, we're not touching it, so it's not like electrons or phonons are traveling to us, but there are photons, right? Photons, that light coming off, that's radiative, right? That's, that's electromagnetic radiation coming off of something. If you heat up your stove and you see it start to glow red, you're seeing that radiative heat, and you can put your hand you know, near it and you can still feel it. That's radiative transport. And then there's convection, which is basically forced air, when air, gases, or liquids um, are being you know, pushed at an object. This is why we blow on our soup. If you've got a hot bowl of soup, you blow on it because you convectively have your breath touch the soup and then carry that heat away with the moving breath. So uh, think of it as like fluid flow, rather, whether that's a gas or a liquid fluid, okay? All right, so now that we know that those are the things that can carry heat, that can contribute to thermal conductivity, now we can dive into whether things should have a high or a low thermal conductivity. Let's start with metals. Metals should have a really high thermal conductivity. Why is that? They should have a large thermal conductivity because they have three electrons. Metals are defined by having lots of electrons available to carry electrical current, right? They can also carry heat. Uh, that's why if you go, uh, you know, cooking marshmallows and you have a stick with a marshmallow on it, your hand's probably not going to get warm. But if you've got a coat hanger with a marshmallow on it, there's a very good chance you're going to burn your hand because that coat hangers, metal, it's got electrons, it's going to conduct heat really well and it might actually burn your hand, okay? So typical values are something like 20 to 400 watts per meter Kelvin uh, for metals. We have something called the wiedemann franz law, which says that there's a constant, the Lorentz number, right, given right here, 2.44 e to the negative 8 ohm watts per meter squared, and that's equal to the ratio of thermal conductivity to electrical conductivity times temperature. So we're going to talk about that more when we get to electrical conductivity in a couple of chapters. Um, but, you know, this is not a law in that it's unviolable. Um, it holds for many materials, but there are exceptions. For most materials, it holds eh, within a factor of two. So you can find things that kind of break it. It's rare to find something that really breaks this. Something, for example, that would be an excellent conductor of electricity, but a rotten thermal conductor. We actually want those for things called thermoelectrics, which we'll talk about in a few chapters. We'd love something that conducts electricity great, but will not conduct heat. But Typically, if you get one, you get the other. If it's a great conductor of heat, it also conducts electricity, and it's hard to decouple those two things, right? That said, you can reduce the thermal conductivity of metals. One way to do that is to alloy your metal. As you form an alloy, think about what you're doing, right? You start out with a nice regular lattice of some sort of metal, right? And when you alloy it, let's say we start to substitute out some of these atoms with others. So now this one's a different atom, this one's a different atom. Well, when you had your wave of atoms, let's say you had like a wave, a phonon traveling through material, it now could get scattered off of this one. It, they can act as scattering sites for your electrons or your photon, phonons, both of which carry heat. And if you scatter them, then they don't carry heat as well. So that's typically what you see here. Take, for example, in this plot, 
Here they're showing you in this plot, um, they're plotting thermal conductivity as a function of composition. So as they go from pure copper over here to pure tin, so this would be tin and this would be copper, you've got copper which has 400 watts per meter Kelvin. It's one of the best thermal conducting metals we have. It's a really good thermal conductor. But as you introduce tin, this thing just plummets. By the time you're at 20% tin, it's clear down, you know, it's dropped by a factor of four or more, right? And then when you're at 50-50, that should be about your lowest, right? Because that's the most disorder that an alloy can get is when you have equal parts of the two elements. And as you come up, it rises again just a little bit to whatever the value it was for pure tin, which doesn't have to be the same as copper, because copper we know is certainly more conductive than tin, uh, but there could be other factors like how phonons interact in the material as well, okay? All right, so that's metals and thermal conductivity. Typically pretty high. What about ceramics? Well, ceramics, it's usually small because there are very few free electrons, right? So that's, remember, if our total thermal conductivity, kappa, right, is equal to kappa electronic plus kappa from phonons, plus kappa from radiation, and so forth, right? If you just get rid of one category because there's no free electrons, you'd expect it to have a lower thermal conductivity. And sure enough, that's what we get here. Um, it's typically lower, and it's dominated by phonon transport, right? This phonon term is the really important one. So lattice vibrations in ceramics are the key ones for them to be good conductors or bad conductors, right? So if you take a material where they can be scattered then it's going to be a less efficient conductor, right? That said, typical values for thermal conductivity in ceramics is something like 2 to 50 watts per meter Kelvin. Um, a lot of the oxides that are around us, you know, that make up dirt all around us are going to be pretty low, 2 to 10, probably even less, right? It's rare to find ceramics that have a lot higher values, but they do exist. Um, we'll give you an example in a minute. Um, the more uh, amorphous ceramics, Right? Remember, an amorphous ceramic doesn't have a regular structure. It's just this random arrangement. Think about how a wave is going to travel through that material, right? How much harder is it for it to form a wave of atoms when they're all over the place, right? It's much harder. So these are really low thermal conductivity materials because they don't have a good phonon. Uh, they don't have ways for the phonons to travel through them uh, efficiently. Instead, they get scattered off of the disordered structure. So amorphous materials like glass like what we make our windows out of in our homes, uh, they are great in that they're transparent and they're great in that they don't conduct heat very well, which is good because we want to be able to see outside, but we don't want to lose a lot of heat through our windows. So it's nice that amorphous materials like glass are also low thermal conductivity materials due to their disordered structure. All right? Now, thermal conductivity has a typical temperature dependence, right? Thermal conductivity has a typical temperature independence where it rises at first, the reason it rises at first is because as you heat a material up, we know from heat capacity, right? What do we know about this? If we go back up to our heat capacity, as you heat, heat it up, its heat capacity rises because you're activating phonon modes. You're basically allowing things to vibrate more and more up until a point when they reach 3R, and then they're not vibrating at a greater rate. They're just maxed out at how they vibrate. So as you heat something up, you're increasing your phonon modes, and those phonons are free to carry heat. So that's why thermal conductivity rises at first. And then it reaches this peak, and it starts to decline at typically like t to the negative 2 or t to the negative 1. Why is this? Well, think of it like people in a subway station. The more people there are in a crowded subway platform, all of a sudden when the train shows up and the people want to get on the train, they start to move more slowly because they're bouncing into one another, right? They, they scatter off of one another. Uh, that's what's happening with phonons. You create so many phonons that now they start to scatter off of one another. And so it's harder to get an overall uh, good conduction of heat from these phonons since they're scattered off of one another. That's why, you know, it's good to activate phonons in terms of increasing thermal conductivity over here. But if you get too many, then you made it worse, right? Because now they scatter off of one another. Uh, that said, you reach this minimum value. Most materials exhibit a minimum thermal conductivity. It's not like it goes all the way to zero, right? That doesn't happen. It reaches a minimum value. And that's because, if we remember, our phonon uh, vibrations have a minimum wavelength that they can have. Way down here. Our average interatomic distance is the smallest wavelength th that we can have. So you can't scatter waves any more than that. Once they're basically being scattered at the atomic wavelength, they can't be scattered uh, anymore. So that puts a, a hard limit for most materials on the minimum thermal conductivity that you can have for these ceramics, okay? Um, so we call this phonon impurity scattering at low temperatures. Uh, any phonon that gets scattered is probably getting scattered off of like impurities in the lattice, like dopants, right? 
Um, but at high temperatures, we call this umklop scattering. Uh, that's when phonons scatter off of one another. One vibration hits another one, and they it messes up their tr traveling through the material. Okay. Um, radiative transport can be significant, but typically it's a high temperature process. It goes. Uh, the Stefan Boltzmann law says that you get uh, you know flux. It's proportional to temperature to the fourth, I think. So it really takes off at high temperatures, and it can be minimal. Like my mouse, it, it's not that hot. It technically is giving heat off. But it's not like I feel it like as if this was white hot. If it's white hot, you can really feel that heat coming off because it's at high temperatures, right? So the flux greatly increases, okay? Um, and things that you can do to change thermal conductivity of ceramics is that you can introduce pores in them. We've already talked a fair bit about why ceramics have pores. Remember, a bunch of these particles have to sort of shrink together. And once they solidify, you get rid of those pores. Well, if you don't get rid of those pores, if there's porosity left over, then you can end up with a really efficient way to reduce your thermal conductivity because air pockets, particularly small air pockets where they don't have convection, meaning the air is not flowing around in response to density gradients, that has really low thermal conductivity. Still air, meaning small air pockets, its thermal conductivity is 0 0.02 watts per meter kelvin. So what's that? A hundred times lower than even low thermal conductivity ceramics. Um, so that is, for example, why when they make windows, when they make windows, they want to make that gap really small, but they put a gap. A dual-paned window has glass right here, it has glass right here, and then it has a little air gap, right? The air gap in the middle is because that is a worse conductor of heat than the solids, right? Which makes sense, because it's not a solid, so phonons are not going to travel through it very well, right? It's going to have... Uh, it's not going to have phonon transport. So again, if we go back up to our equation, if you drop out phonon transport, then you have to rely on radiative or convection. So now convection is what dominates uh, thermal conductivity in air, especially still air. Uh, then you get rid of that even. You just get radiative. Um, okay. Let's uh, finally talk about polymers. Thermal conductivity of polymers is typically very, very low. You can get values of like 0 0.3 watts per meter kelvin. So it's still 10 times greater than uh, foam, right, air, air pockets in foam, but it's 10 times less than most ceramics. Um, where does the energy transfer come from? It comes from vibration and rotation of these polymer chains, right? So as a whole chain now can vibrate, it could technically conduct heat, but that's not nearly as efficient as individual atoms being able to form vibrations, right? Um, obviously, you can make polymers that are more crystalline and less crystalline, and as you increase the crystallinity, you're going to make it better for vibrations to travel through it, so you get higher thermal conductivity for high crystallinity polymers like PET or Kevlar or things like that. Um, but this is one of the reasons why uh, insulated foams right, are often made of polymers. And what's interesting, they actually start with like a polymer, right? So you've got your polymer, let's say it's in a liquid form, so you've got liquid in here. They put compressed gas in there, so they'll compress this with gas, so then the gas molecules, these all get moved into the material. They dissolve into your material at high pressures because they're squeezing on the system, they're, compre they're putting compressed gas there. And then when they spray it, so imagine now you've got this system here, it's a liquid full of a bunch of dissolved gas molecules and as soon as you take away that compression so if you take like a can of great stuff or a can of expanded polyurethane, polyurethane foam when you spray it like this guy's doing over here as he sprays it you're taking away that confining pressure so these tiny gas molecules want to expand right and you end up with the whole thing expanding dramatically they can they can expand like 60 times or something i can't remember the number they can expand in huge ways each one of those dissolved gas molecules turns into a not no longer dissolved, it turns into gas uh, by forming a bubble, right? And that's how you uh, form really great insulation using polymers. That's why it's often used for lots of insulation applications. 